Great, thank you very much. And uh, I think on behalf of all the previous presenters, I'd like to thank you for, for AIMS for once again arranging this and um, giving us the opportunity to meet, talk and understand the challenges and how people are addressing the issues associated with the migration towards IP. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Selvage. I'm the European Regional Development Manager for LEADER based in London in the UK. And what I'm going to try and do in the next 25 minutes is simplify a lot of the jargon, some of the graphics that are associated with 2110-21, the traffic shaping and timing. And hopefully at the end of this, you'll have an understanding of exactly what's going on and what some of the other parameters are that are involved, that are measured as part of this standard. So as we said, 2110-21 specifies the timing model for senders and receivers of RTP streams. And most of you will be familiar with the term CMAX and VRX within this standard. The move to IP and IT technologies within a broadcast facility brings with it considerations that we've not that really existed in the baseband world. And the new one that broadcasters are facing is the emerging non-linear data flows. So with 2110, the timing information has been removed from the underlying hardware layer, making the distribution asynchronous. So with current broadcast formats, the video must be frame synchronous at the camera sensor and the viewer's television screen. And with SDI, that's always been the case. But now, with the intermediate IP distribution network is asynchronous, but the variance in packet jitter directly, directly affects latency, leading to potentially longer video and audio delays than we've come to experience in the SDI world. So if we don't look to cater for those, we are going to have interruptions and quality of service issues. Therefore, to present, prevent quality of service issues, we need to prevent network problems and to make it easier to design signal receivers. It makes sense to set some limits on the size and duration of the packet bursts. And that is what's known as traffic shaping, or if you're from a network world, delivery timing. So, as we move to these IP infrastructures, we have some new names to describe devices. So cameras and devices that acquire signals are known as senders. They then move those signals across the network and then they, they are received at devices that can display those images or the next stage of processing, thus a receiver. So the signal, has a complex route through the ISO model from the sender to the receiver. So let's keep that in mind as we look at the traffic shaping. So as we've talked, 2110-21 defines the packet delivery timing characteristics as they leave the transmission interface of the sender. And within dash 21, there are three models we talk about. The narrow gap, also typically hardware senders, narrow linear, and most of these are typically transmission systems, and finally wide senders. And with the adoption of software-based applications, we're seeing more and more software senders being deployed within these systems. So let's take a look at the narrow gap in a bit more detail. SMPTE 2110 specifies that only the visible part of video, i.e. the active pixels, should be transmitted. Thus, leaving out the ancillary data, which is carried separately as part of the Dash 40 stream, which means that the packet flow has a gap. So thus, the narrow gap sender looks very much like an SDI stream, but with the ancillary data, the blanking removed. 
And we have the last packet of the frame or field. And then we have the first packet of the next frame or field. So for those of us familiar with SDI, this is very simple. It's easy to understand. It basically means the packets come in nice and evenly spaced in groups with a gap. They go into the video buffer and then turned into a picture on the receiving device. If we now look at the narrow linear, basically it's the same packets, but they're now evenly spaced out and the gap has been removed. So now we get a nice even flow of packets coming into the buffer. They're processed and drained out and we have a picture on the receiving device. And the final model is the wide sender. And this one, basically the packets are sent as and when the sender processes the unit, processes packets and place them onto the network. And as you can see, there is a wider bitrate variation here. So as you design your systems, if you have any wide senders, you must have wide receivers. Otherwise, you will not be able to read the data coming from these devices. And now, typically, the wide receivers have to have a larger data buffer. Otherwise, you're going to starve them or they're going to overflow. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So you'll hear the term overflow error. What do we mean by that? In simplistic terms, it means that you're flooding the buffer. There's too many packets in there. They can't drain out and packets are lost. And as we all know, in the world of IP, especially with video, we can't afford to lose packets. The other term you'll hear is underflow error. And that's when basically the packets arriving in the buffer result in the buffer emptying and being starved of data. So it's got nothing to pass on to the receiver. And again, you'll have a quality of service issue. And that's referred to as an underflow error. So let's take a look at how you measure these. And we're going to go off to the receiving device, first of all. So many of you will be familiar with the graphic on the right. But have you looked at it in detail? And what is it actually telling us? Well, first of all, it's showing us the packets arriving at the receiver. So these have come off the network. They're hitting the network interface card. They are now arriving. But it takes time for them to be processed before they can be read out of the receiver. And that's the second graph. And finally, the graph at the bottom is the virtual receiver buffer. And we'll talk about that a little bit further in this presentation. So let's take a deeper dive now into the packet arrival. And remember, we're only moving the active packets. So here we have the first frame video or the first field that's arrived at the receiver. And here we have them as they are now ready to be drained out of the receiver. This is a narrow gapped sender. So as you saw previously, we now have a packet arrival gap between the last packet of the first frame of video and the first packet of the second frame of video. And again, that is replicated in the packet read schedule. So for those of us thinking SDI wise, this is where the Hank and Bank information would have been placed in SDI. So to indicate the first packet of active video, and this is a measurement that's going to come up in a minute, we here can see where that packet has arrived in the receiver and then when it's went ready to be read out. And the difference between those two is referred to as the margin. And again, we have a marker bit, which is used to indicate the last packet 
of the field or frame of video. And again, there's going to be a difference between the packet when it arrives and when the packet is ready to leave. So, as we mentioned, we cannot afford to lose packets. That's just a written in law. It can't happen in the world of 2110. Otherwise, we have a quality of service issue. So bursts and jitter could potentially lead to packet loss in the network, therefore jeopardizing the reliability of the solution. So SIMT 2110 has introduced a leaky bucket with a maximum CMAX level to prevent loss. And as you can see here, this shows the maximum size of the buffer. And C inst is the instantaneous value of what's in the buffer at any given time. And obviously the buffer will have a defined drain rate. So I mentioned finally, we have the virtual receiver buffer. So this is how the sender sees how it behaves with the receiving device. And it's a very simple graphic that here we have the first packet has arrived. So the virtual buffer has been incremented by one. Now, second packet has arrived and it's been incremented again. So we now have two. And finally, the third one has arrived. So we now have three. But at the same time, the packet reschedule is now at a point where the first packet can drain from the receiver. So that leaves and we're now back to two. So as you can see, this will now toggle up and down between two and three until we get to the end of the frame. So that is what the virtual receiver, and it's gonna give you an indication of what type of sender you have. So let's look at a real world operation here. So how can you measure, how can, these measurements be simplified and displayed for real-time monitoring and analysis. So SIPTI is currently working on harmonizing the interpretation and naming of the different measurements associated with 2110-20 and 21. Um, this is RP2120-25 and it's a SIPTI project that is harmonizing these. So this is not published, some of the names are changing, some of the way the measurements are done are still changing. But let's take a look. So one of the key things we talked about was the first packet arrival time. And here we have a graphic that's showing that first packet arrival time based upon time. Again, C inst, what's the instantaneous value within the buffer? And VRX. Here again, we have a graphic against time showing us what the values of the buffer have been. And also the latency and the RTP clock. As we know, everything has an RTP timestamp that is referenced to the PTP. So therefore we need to know how the signals are being received with their RTP timestamp in relation to PTP. And large delays can cause us quality of service issues. And we have within the fabrics products, again, the first packet arrival information, the C inst display, the RX, and also latency and the RTP clock giving you information on your video, your audio, and your ancillary data. And probably one of the most comprehensive set of tools that we have is the leader IP analyzer, the LVB440, which on a single screen displays all of the previous measurement parameters and some additional ones that I'm gonna talk about now. So first packet arrival time and RTP offset. VRX and network burstiness. So let's take a look at some of the other ones that haven't been previously mentioned. The first one I'm going to talk about is path delay. And this is the difference between the timestamp of the packets from the sender 
and the time they arrive at the receiver. So they're all linked to PTP, and that way we can see what's going on across the network. RTP alignment. This allows for the synchronization of multiple devices if you're in a multi IP stream environment. And ideally, this should be zero. But in the example I have here, we have an offset of 33.3 microseconds, which indicates that the sender is not correctly synchronized as per 2110 standard. So if you had multiple senders, then when you cut between the sources, you're going to notice a timing difference. So these parameters allow you to understand the behavior of the senders and the behavior of the network that the signals or the packets are traversing to get to the receiving device. We talked about the first packet arrival, there's also the first packet margin. And this is telling you how much margin in time there was available between when you received the first packet of the video frame and the transmission offset. And this again is another critical tool to understand the performance and operation of your system. And the final piece of the challenge is what happens if we're running in 2022-7 mode of operation? So we not only have all of those timing parameters that we need to analyze, but we also need to look at path one and path two and tools are available to carry out the measurement of the deltas between paths one and path two. As, we, as can be seen here, that the blue chart has had a number of spikes, which mean a larger than expected path delay, which could cause concern for the operation. And here on the fabrics interface, we have the same tools with the skew displaying the differential between the signals. And again here, on a single display, you have your video, your audio, and your ancillary data. And finally, on the IP analyzer, we have this waterfall display. So on the left, I have my primary source. On the right, I have my secondary path. And I've got here in real time, as this would fall down, a spread of the packet arrival. So I can see if I've got any packets outside the, the arrival time I'm expecting, if I've got any dropped packets. And the chart also allows me to see where the majority of the packets are arriving with this brighter line. If I just change this to pointer here. With this brighter line here, which is showing where the majority of the packets are arriving. So we can see on this case, they're arriving around about three microseconds. But what's really useful on this display is that we have the ability to see which packets are being received first on the primary or the secondary. And as you can see here, all of the packets are arriving and on the secondary first. For many people, they only find out that 2022-7 isn't working when the secondary fails because you weren't aware the primary failed because it's done its job. So as you can see here, I'd be looking at this slightly concerned. The system is protected because the path differential between the two is still around about 1.485 microseconds. But I'd be looking to even up that loading because that's quite a concern to me. So hopefully, I've tried to explain a lot of the parameters that you may have heard of, wondered exactly what they are and what the relevance they are to you in your day-to-day -day operations and why you should be looking at them and understanding what's going in with, on within your operation. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, so, so question I have, um, and, and again, if anybody else has uh, questions from the audience, feel free to put it in the, um, the chat window or whatever. Um, is there a uh, way that you see these measurements being made 
uh, properly in a, um, a virtualized environment. You know, we, we just heard from, you know, Gordon Castle talking about, you know, his tech centers and things like that. Uh, how, how does one go about, um, you know, taking these tools and, you know, because you're making such precise measurements, how do, how do you m verify these devices are performing correctly in a uh, very virtual uh, type of system? I think this is the big headache and challenge that we've got. We're, we're putting these out into, into networks that we have no control of. They're third party networks, they're third party infrastructures, you're renting lines. Mm -hmm. You've got like, what you're probably going to need to look at is having these tools at least kind of in those centers so that you know what's going on inside your facility or inside your cloud is good. Because you've got to have some reference point to work from. Mm -hmm. So if you know, a bit like let's, let's take the days of SDI with an OB truck and a broadcast facility, you know, the signal not coming back, you've got problems with what you're receiving. So the first thing typically you do is you're chatting to the engineer in charge saying, I've got a problem with this. And he's looking around and goes, yeah, my ref, I've lost my GPS reference. Oh, is it all right now? You need to mm -hmm. have base points in this world that you know are good. Right. Um, the tools we're looking at here, especially with the IP analyzer and that, if you start placing them in different locations, you can actually remotely start to analyze them. So you can have them side by side and you're looking saying, well, my production center's good. Oh, my distribution center, there's something wrong there. Then you can start to dig into those and start looking and then maybe extend yourself and start looking for a sender that's outside of your network to start looking at those characteristics, what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be simple as something that you're set up for, you know, receiving narrow signals and somebody's stuck a gateway and, like, and it's a wide sender. And that's why it's just wiping you out. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting to know what these things do. We haven't had to do this with SDI because the pack, you know, it was a nice asynchronous bang, 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 and the receiver <laughs> device just took it and the timing was in there. Well, and, and, then, and then and then you'd run around and you'd, you'd hook up a, uh, a portable test set by unplugging the SDI cable to figure out what the heck was going on, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the great thing we have here is now is that you can connect to that right. multicast flow at many points across its journey. Right. That, you know, you've got the, you've got the ability to knife and fork this from the comfort of your armchair, <laughs> rather than climbing in a rack. And as you said, I'm pulling a BNC, plugging it in. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Right. Does it come out looking like that? Right, yeah. right, okay. right. Okay. The SDI route is good. Onto the distribution amplifiers, you know. Yeah, yeah. Lots of time climbing in and out of the rack and things like that. <laughs> so, so um, so, so, you know, one of the things, the other things here, maybe that, that's, that's maybe um, interest, you know, maybe you want to say something about it, maybe not. Um, where do you see, you know, do you see the boundary shifting between monitoring, which I would think of as being things that you are measuring continuously or, you know, pulling data from the, uh, the end devices to, to analyze versus what you might call testing or diagnostic tools where you're going in and you're, you're examining things, you know, to to find to to troubleshoot a problem. Do you see that um, boundary moving in the IP world? And you know, what are your thoughts about that? If you want, I do. I mean, one of the one of the observations I've had from a number of clients is that they need these tools to monitor over a prolonged period mm -hmm. because typically, what happens with these IP networks is they don't drop off a cliff and they fail. If you go back and you're looking at the right traces and you've got the right information, you can actually see the trends of, of things starting to move, uh -huh. starting to drift. And that's one of the things we've looked at here with the IP analyzer is the ability to set up alarms that are a lot tighter than the 2110 standards. So you know you're operating within that, but if they start to fire off and you're starting to get these warning messages, it means something is drifting 
or it may be there's congestion on the network because somebody has thought, oh, we can just push all of those services through that switch while we do an upgrade down the road, you know. It's, sure. You know, you, you need these tools and, you know, the, you know, I was chatting to somebody yesterday, you know, they said, really, we need up to like 72 hours of, of like monitoring to be able to go back and look through. If it's longer than 72 hours, it's a major problem. So you need that snapshot, you almost, almost that instantaneous look, so you can go in, look at things like I showed you there with the 2022-7. It's, it's all leaning one way. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not affecting your service. Everything's going on fine, and it meets the standard. But that's not really how it should be operating, and you should be looking at pulling it back, balancing it up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... We've had this discussion about the term analyzing and monitoring, and it sort of it crosses over, and there's a kind of area in between it. You know, it's a new language. It's you know, it's it's part of the new vocabulary that's come with twenty one ten and an IP. And thanks to our network friends for bringing this to us. <laughs>